hearing from voters in one of Arizona's few swing districts. And I think that there's good things on, on both sides. And looking ahead at the next high profile debate in the race for U.S. Senate. It's hard to get a sense of where either of their true values uh, stand. Plus challenges tied with getting the Latino vote to materialize. The sad truth of it is that they have really low participation rates. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Christopher Conover filling in for Lorraine Rivera. Thanks for joining us. The same week early ballots began arriving in the mail, candidates in one of the nation's most competitive congressional races debated for the first time. Arizona Public Media hosted the candidates in the second congressional district. Democrat Ann Kirkpatrick and Republican Leah Marquez Peterson at the Tucson Jewish Community Center. In front of a crowd of a few hundred guests, the candidates' first round of questions dealt with politics. Legislating is about building relationships, and I am able to do that. That's how you get things done. You find people, find out what their story is, regardless of party, and find that common ground. I've been running one of the largest chambers of commerce in our state, our Tucson Hispanic Chamber, and working with whoever it will take to get the job done, whether they be Democrat, Republican, or Independent. The candidates also traded verbal jabs. Yeah, I believe Ann Kirkpatrick will vote for Nancy Pelosi. She's voted with her over 90% of the time as she served in Congress before. Um, I think that if Ann is elected to the seat, we will see tax reform roll back. We'll see the economy, all the great progress we've seen, that will roll back. My opponent brought uh, Speaker Ryan to Tucson. She will follow his agenda to a T. She's not independent. Uh, he has his agenda of privatizing Social Security. She has said she would privatize Social Security. Other topics included water. One of the first things we can do is appoint a director of Bureau and Land Management. That's an important function, an important person that can relate to the, the water situation and the crisis we're facing in Cochise County. I think decisions about water need to be made locally by local jurisdictions and they need to be at the table. One of the things we really need to do is have a statewide drought plan. We are in a drought, uh, but we need to be all working together off of the same blueprint to preserve our water. Immigration reform. I support DREAMers uh, achieving legal status. Um, I do not believe it should include a pathway to citizenship and that we need to focus on immigration reform. The border's only secure when the people who live there feel that it's secure. And I know ranchers along that. The border who feel that the president's policies are, are inflaming the issue. They packed their closing statements with more critiques. I'm running for office to represent our community, and she's running for this office simply to get back to D.C. She wants to put Social Security in the hands of Wall Street. We saw what happened when the greedy Wall Street bankers looked out for themselves, not the American people, and we had the Great Recession. After hearing from the candidates, we heard from voters in the district they hope to represent, two Democrats and two Republicans. Our discussion began shortly after the debate ended. With different parties and professions, all four have deep ties to CD2. Democrat Gary Jones, a geophysicist who grew up in Cochise County and now lives in I'm Tucson. I had the great pleasure to grow up and go to public schools in Douglas, Arizona, K through 12. Republican Cami Quist, who owns a restaurant near the University of Arizona. I was a stay-at-home mom for a while, and then once my son got school age, became school age, I started with small business. Republican Ed Biggers, who moved to Tucson in 1983 and climbed the ranks at Hughes Aircraft Company. Uh, I ended up uh, being the president of the Hughes Missile Group, and uh, I serve as the advisor to the engineering school at the U of A. And Debbie Hickman, an educator and chairwoman of the Cochise County Democrats. And I spent a lot of time teaching in Sierra Vista and doing enormous amount of other work, too. Now for opening statements. All four came to the debate, supporting their party's candidate. The night didn't change their minds, but it gave them an opportunity to explain their differences. The Democrats don't decide, the Republicans don't decide. In this district, the people in the middle decide. So I think the task for both Ann Kirkpatrick and for Leah Marquez-Peterson is, is how, how are the people in the middle hearing their message? 
issues they see making the biggest impact all varied. From minimum wage hikes overburdening small business. For small business, I think we need somebody in Washington that has a voice, and I feel like Am Kirkpatrick is just, I hate to say this, but it, a Pelosi patsy that's just going to write checks off of government money that has nothing that will help me as a small business owner. To a recent sewage line break in Mexico that spilled over into Naco, Arizona. It's a, a situation. I mean, I know they've had Martha McSally down there once. She did a photo op. She left. She said, oh, I'll help you fix this. Never another word. The other day, somebody talked to Gail Griffin, who is one of the major uh, players down there in the LT14. And she just said, oh, this is a Mexico problem. No, it's not. Mexico is not having the problem. The problem is with um, in, in Arizona now, and it's a health problem, a very serious health problem. Other concerns included slow economic growth in southern Arizona. And, uh, even though the, the tax bill that got passed was uh, called a, for the rich man, what that tax bill did was create lots of jobs for lots of people, and it's just, and it's just beginning. The, the, the result of that is just beginning. Now, I just spent time yesterday with my tax advisor, and I would say I'm in the upper tax bracket, and he showed me my projection for next year uh, under the new law. I didn't save any money at all. So that many large deductions got eliminated. <laughs> so, yeah. so that was not a bill for, for the upper tax bracket. That was a bill to help businesses create yeah. jobs, in their, and it's happening. So I see that as a major thing in, for the economy of Tucson and southern Arizona, because the economy has not been good in southern Arizona for a long time. I think it comes down to really, really two. I've spent the last two days in, at uh, the St. Pius Church working with the migrants that have just been released by ICE. Uh, with no notice and, and helping to process those folks and move them on to their families. So it, comprehensive immigration reform is part and parcel of a border security package. The second major issue, in my view, is, is climate. Uh, the, uh, Anne mentioned it today. Uh, there's another hurricane. Uh, I was organizing dispatch for dozens of families, uh, migrant families, towards uh, points east. They all got canceled today because of the extra hurricane that is hitting the south coast today that jumped from a tropical depression to a category three and a half hurricane in three days. This never used to happen. Let me jump out of the district, uh, if we will, and, and talk national for a moment. Do you all, as, as voters in a purple district, uh, as you all have said, view this election, this midterm election, as a referendum on the Trump presidency? I think the midterm election has always, uh, has always been a problem for the party in power, and, uh, and I think more so this year because of the, uh, the president and his behavior. I voted for President Trump because I, I supported, uh, I wanted to see tax policy changed. I, uh, I wanted to see Supreme Court justices that would, uh, would be similar to my view of what they would be uh, in terms of how they viewed the Constitution. But uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, President Trump has uh, behaved in such a way to uh, increase the, the, the level of hostility that happens to be existing in the country. And, and I think, yes, this, uh, th that, will be that will be tested in this election. A key aspect to think for all people in CD2 to think about this year is what should the Congress do in the next session over the next two years. And I think one of the key functions is to hold the administration accountable. And uh, that's best done with, with the Democrats in control of, of, of Congress. I feel like there's so much partisan Democrats versus Republican, it's your fault, it's your fault, that if I run my business the way Washington is being run currently with all the fighting, that nothing gets done. So I guess I just feel like it's extremely important to get out there and vote. But on the opposite, I feel like if the Democrats get in, you know, we might as well move to Canada. Honestly, under Obama, we did tear, it was awful. And in the last two years, I disagree with you. I think Trump has opened up the small business. I think we've been able to hire more employees. I've been able to open a second store. You know, Obama had the most horrible beginning, not because of him, but because of that horrible crash. And he had to build that up slowly. So it's not surprising that you and other businesses were struggling then.
you all are involved in the community, be it through work with a church, private businesses, small businesses, uh, education. What do you tell people about what's going on right now? And as private citizens, is there anything you can do individually to reach out and maybe get rid of some of this divide? I would love to have a discussion and, and hear your side of things. And also, I haven't run a huge business like that, but I have to run my business. Right. And for you to hear how the minimum wage affected me, what we had to do, our costs and our struggles, because that's how I think you're really gonna bridge the gap and become a community. There are some, some things that the Republicans and the, and the Democrats can really work on together. And I, there needs to be immigration reform. And I'm frustrated that there's not immigration reform. I'm frustrated with the DACA thing. I, I mean, it makes no sense to me that some would say, well, we need to ship those people out of the country. Ms. Kirkpatrick and Ms. Marquez-Peterson, thank you for answering our questions. Thank you for taking the time to run for office. <laughs> on this night, no one changed anyone's minds but they did find some common ground. What I hear a lot is just a kind of callousness on the part of any issues like that that we find just, you know, ridiculous and abhorrent. I agree and, with you. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and I need to hear more Republicans who are saying what you just said about yeah. DACA. It's a I totally agree. I, I totally agree and as well. And I, I just want your voice to rise because your leaders in Congress are not saying that. I can guarantee you. Leah knows how I feel about it, and she yeah. agrees. Yeah, yeah I know. So yeah, important. that's excellent. I think just respect. I, I respect your opinion. I respect your opinion, and I think we all should respect each other. And I think that there's good things on, on both sides. As we often do with political debates, we want to take a few minutes to look back on some of the claims and make sure they are correct and the candidates answered the questions. Let's begin with candidate Kirkpatrick's answer about NAFTA. How many people know what Trump plans to do with NAFTA? Uh, I haven't heard anything. That's the problem with this administration. Kirkpatrick is not wrong. The on-again, off-again negotiations were handled behind closed doors. But throughout the process, negotiators have offered details, and our own Nancy Montoya has reported extensively about the final agreement, especially what it means for the dairy industry and other agricultural interests in Arizona. We next turn to the question about climate change, asked by Ron Hansen of the Arizona Republic. Lee Marquez uh, Peterson, uh, do you accept the science of climate change? And if so, what are you willing to do to act on that, in, that uh, body of knowledge from uh, climate scientists? I think uh, it's a delicate balance between uh, growing a company and the environmental regulations that are put in place and not having them overreach. Uh, but I think it is a very delicate balance that must be met. That response brought an audible laugh from the live audience. We still don't know if candidate Marquez Peterson accepts the scientific conclusions about climate change. And ending on a positive note about bipartisanship. Both candidates were asked to name one issue they could work on across the aisle. I think we need a bipartisan solution for the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I think we need to figure out something that's going to work, looking for ideas, uh, insurance across state lines, association plans. We need to sit together, nonpartisan nature, and, and figure this out because we cannot do without quality health insurance. There are three federal programs that the funding needs to be restored. Head Start, Secure Rural Schools, and Payment in Lieu of Taxes. Arizona is unique in that over 80% of our land is public land. We fund education on property tax, Payment in lieu of taxes is meant to make up for the, that lack of private property when we have so much federal and state public land. Arizona Public Media's next debate is Wednesday between Congressional District 3 candidates, Democratic incumbent Raul Grijalva, and Republican challenger Nick Pearson. That's happening live in our studio. You can watch it beginning at 7 p.m. on PBS 6 right after that debate at 8 p.m., Tune in to PBS 6 Plus, where we'll re-air the U.S. Senate debate between Martha McSally and Kirsten Cinema, presented by Arizona PBS. We've heard from the candidates in CD2. We've heard from the voters in CD2. Now we get some analysis from some local journalists. 
Joining us now are Jim Nitzel with the Tucson Weekly and Dan Scherer with the Green Valley News. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure. With this CD2 debate, did anybody score any points? Leah Marquez-Peterson needed a game changer in this debate. She, when you look at that New York Times poll uh, where she was down 11 points, Ann Kirkpatrick 50, uh, uh, Leah Marquez-Peterson 39, she definitely needed to turn this race around and I don't think she did that in that debate. I think both of them, you know, were able to recite their talking points. I think Leah was kind of vacuous on a lot of them. You know, the, the, the whole notion that she couldn't talk about climate change was disturbing. Uh, but I, I don't think she turned it around and, and I think the, the reflection of that is the fact that the NRCC announced this week that they're pulling out uh, $450,000 worth of what probably would have been negative advertising hitting Ann Kirkpatrick. Uh, that shows that they had, can read a poll and that uh, Leah Marquez-Peterson uh, is going to have to turn things around dramatically if she's going to win this race. I would agree. I don't know that she hit it out of the park, but I think Leah Marquez-Peterson uh, showed a general overall knowledge that was uh, pretty solid, uh, although I did feel like we were watching candidates who had done a couple of hours of research on the internet and came and, and gave that to us, and I, so I wasn't really overly impressed. I think what I was surprised about in all of this was Ann Kirkpatrick's uh, almost complete ignorance on the new NAFTA uh, deal that's out there. She um, didn't did, didn't say anything on it, and, on it, and I don't know that she even has read it. Uh, so I was a little surprised at that. And Leah Marcus Peterson really kind of hammered home at what she was strong on, which is U U.S. Mexico relations. We know she's down there a lot and does a lot of work there. The climate change thing was a little odd, though. Um, her answer to that now trying to answer a climate change question in 45 seconds is tough, but um, that is the one that drew the laughs and probably should have. We had Gabby Giffords and Ron uh, Barber representing. We've had Martha McSally, a Republican, representing. Is this just a normal flip back uh, with Ann Kirkpatrick? It seems like, if the polls are correct, winning this over Leah Marquez-Peterson? That's what every forecaster has uh, going on here. It's certainly uh, the, the fact that the NRCC is pulling out indicates that. And I think the Marquez-Peterson campaign has not had a very good campaign. I, for whatever reason, they decided to freeze out the media. And, and Leah Marquez-Peterson had good relationships with the press in this community. She definitely could have worked the refs a lot better than she has. That the fact that you can't get a sit-down interview with her indicates that uh, she's scared of something, of something coming out, uh, questions from the press having to answer, talk about Trump perhaps. But whatever reason it is, uh, I think she's just running a terrible campaign. And, and the only Trump question at that forum, they both pretty much just ignored because nobody really wants to go there. What do voters want to hear in this district? Again, it's, it's a rural district, it's an urban district. Uh, interesting political split. What do they want to hear from these candidates? The voters that are in play here, which are women, uh, want to hear that uh, the people are going to stand up against the Trump administration. That's, that's uh, if you look at the polling, I think uh, in the district there's a 15 point spread in favor of people who want to see uh, whoever wins this race stand up against Donald Trump as opposed to help the Trump administration continue to enact its agenda. I think that that's what we like to think people are thinking about, but really they're thinking about the basics, jobs and good schools and roads and, and a lot of stuff that is really out of reach of the federal government to, to a point. I don't know that Trump is really playing that much of a role uh, down here, uh, but clearly Leah Marcus Peterson did want to distance herself a little, a little bit from him. Let's switch over to the U.S. Senate race. Uh, this week, new poll out puts Martha McSally up by six points. First time we've really seen a poll where either of these candidates has been outside the margin of error. Well, Martha McSally has always closed strong in her congressional races. But I think the other polls we're seeing are very, very neck and neck. Uh, so this may be an outlier. I think there was a CNN poll that actually showed cinema up a nine or ten, which was, I think, also an outlier. I think this one remains neck and neck right now. Which is a way of saying it's who shows up at the polls. And I'm still not convinced that young people will, particularly not in that race. It just is too much education effort for them to figure out uh, where the candidates stand. We talked to Martha McSally last week. She says it's a dead heat. I think that's probably a, a right on uh, ass assessment. What I find fascinating about both of these candidates is their ability to be political chameleons. I mean, you've had uh, Martha McSally when she was running down here was, uh, you know, uh, 
taking very moderate stances on the issues. She was avoiding Donald Trump. She wouldn't say if she would vote for Donald Trump. She As Leah Marquez Peterson and Ann Kirkpatrick are doing in the same district. Exactly. And, and then once Martha announced she was running for the Senate, you saw this complete embrace of Donald Trump. And, and it was a transformation for those of us who have watched her down here. Kirsten Sinema, of course, uh, started out very far on the left and really moved into a much more centrist persona as she won her congressional seat and as she moved into this campaign. So they, they've both moved around quite a bit. It, it's hard to get a sense of where either of their true values uh, stand, but uh, they both are, are trying to put themselves into a position where they think the voters will support them in November. This has been a pretty nasty race. The ads on TV, both the ones run by the candidates and the outside groups, have not pulled any punches. Does that turn voters off in a race that's this tight? That's the wrong question. The question is, will it win over some voters? And unfortunately, it always does. And we were looking at uh, some uh, how money was spent back in the Obama races, and uh, 80 to 90 percent was on negative ads because they work. As we wrap this up, uh, let's look forward a little bit. Obviously, uh, we will have a new member of the U.S. Senate uh, coming in. Does who wins the U.S. Senate race affect John Kyle's decision of whether to stay for another year or to, as he said, you know, just finish up at the end of this Congress? Tough to say, but I, I suspect that if Martha McSally were to lose this seat, uh, there, she'd certainly be a nice pick for Do Governor Ducey to move into that Kyle, the, the McCain slash Kyle seat, if indeed she doesn't win. And November. I think John, John Kyle's decision could uh, be dependent on what happens nationwide uh, with, with the Senate, if, if there's any shift or anything there. So that's a very interesting uh, question. If McSally doesn't win, would she be the, uh, the choice? And I would agree that probably she would be, uh, and she'll take the seat any way she can get it. At this point, it looks like she might win it. We'll see. A statewide push to register more voters for the midterm included outreach to Latino communities. The organization, Mi Familia Vota, says it exceeded its goal in Pima County and registered 10,000 new voters. While it potentially signals that the Latino vote is in play this November, we heard from political scientist Lisa Sanchez about some of the obstacles with turnout. Just about every election season, we hear some discussion of the sleeping giant or, uh, you know, the the, uh, in the 80s, they had a term for it, what was it, brown power uh, in the 70s as well. So, I mean, every election we sort of come up on this. And it's because of this sort of growing phenomenon of Latino voters. And we hope that they're going to get involved and participate in this next election. But the, the, the sad truth of it is that they have really low participation rates in sort of in proportion to their population size. About 31 percent of Arizona's population, according to the census, uh, identifies as Latino. What will make them come to the ballot box, do you think? Well, we hope that issues have a big impact, right? So, you know, immigration has been sort of on, on the national agenda for several years now. Um, and so, you know, with increasingly sort of punitive laws going on the books at the state level and certainly with border walls being built and prototypes being built at the at the national border, you know, we think that those things will kind of excite voters. And we certainly see a lot of evidence in polling data that suggests that they're getting more excited, right? And that they're looking forward to each election with more fervor. And yet sometimes it just doesn't kind of materialize into a vote. Very often when we look at voting trends across the population overall, older people vote, Younger people don't vote. Is the same true in the Latino community? And how does it play with the overall demographic of the Latino community here in Arizona? Absolutely. So part of that is that the Latino community is very young. So somewhere, you know, the, the national average median age is like 41, 42, um, somewhere in there. But when we're talking about Latinos, it's very much younger. It's usually in the, you know, the high, the low 30s, high 20s um, as an average, right? So we're talking about a very young population who already is sort of prone to non-voter habits. And so, you know, adding, coupling it with the youth vote makes it even more sort of a non-voting population. National statistics this year from groups like Naleo say that 60% of Latino voters as of about a week ago 
hadn't been reached out to by any campaign, be it a phone call, an email, a direct mail. Is that a surprising number? Sadly, it's not surprising, but it should be shocking, right? It should make us feel bad about what's going on in terms of our kind of democratic process. Um, you know, kind of the issue being, the best indicator of when somebody's going to go out and vote is if they're mobilized. That's just simple, simple logic is being asked to vote. And mobilization doesn't necessarily have to happen at kind of a, a partisan level or the candidate level. Certainly that helps and that's a really good type of mobilization. But you can be asked to vote by coworkers, by parents, by spouses. Spouses are great, right, to getting us to do things. So, you know, mobilization, some of that is maybe an undercount of those other types of mobilization, but it's certainly not a good feeling to see that the Latino community is not being mobilized. For a campaign or a party to reach out to Latino voters, do they need to do that differently than they would to other groups of voters? I mean, certainly there is sort of a, a, cultural differences. There's also language barriers in certain cases. Um, other issues are sort of SES barriers or socioeconomic status, which is just a fancy word for saying that, you know, their occupations, uh, income levels, and education levels are lower than sort of the rest of the population, which, again, a really sad statistic. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be mobilized. Um, so things like providing um, campaign literature in different languages, really helpful in Spanish. Um, also, making sure that they have uh, Latinos or Hispanics or other minorities to go out there and sort of canvas that vote. I mean, I think it helps to see people involved in the process who look like you, right? It, it makes you feel like you have efficacy. And we certainly see this from the Latino community when we poll and we ask these questions. Within the Latino community, does it also break down as it does within so many other communities between men and women, different issues uh, for those folks? Uh, you know, there's some evidence that, that there's some differences between uh, female and male Latinos. Um, but by and large, they're pretty similar issues, pretty much, you know, education is a huge issue for the Latino population. Um, one thing we have seen kind of different in the, last, in the last election is Latina mothers and grandmothers really getting involved in mobilizing their own population, which is, is, you know, mobilization is the big story right now for Latinos. So this is a really good indicator that they're starting to sort of take ownership of the socialization process for getting voters out and mobilizing. So that's a little bit different. So maybe the participation piece is a place where we're starting to see changes. All right, Dr. Lisa Sanchez, thanks so much for sitting down with us. Thank you. And that's all for now. Thanks for joining us. To get a look at next week's program, visit us on social media and let us know what you think. Lorraine Rivera is back next week. We'll see you then.